All right. I am Amy McKinty, and I am going to be reading uh, a selection or a book called Everything Sad is Untrue uh, by Daniel Nieri. Uh, a couple things that I want to talk about before I actually start reading the book. This book is a memoir. So a memoir is just a story, uh, a true story told about a specific uh, period in time um, of the author's life. So this is about the author Daniel Neary's experience as an Iranian immigrant in the 1990s. So he was in seventh grade. So that brings me to a couple things that I want to bring up um, as well, which is that this book is written through a seventh grade perspective. So you might call the narrator a little bit unreliable. Um, we all know a seventh grade perspective is a limited perspective. Um, for that reason, the beginning of the book can seem a little chaotic. His mind is everywhere which would be a typical seventh grader. So I ask for your patience. I promise you, you will not be disappointed if you stick with this book. Um, his story is very compelling and very touching. Uh, but I just thought that was an interesting side note or an important side note that you should know as you start listening to the story. Second, because he is an Iranian immigrant, there are some language, the Farsi language uh, that his family back home speaks. And he does actually flash back to times when he lived in Iran or from what he can remember from living in Iran. So I will ask your forgiveness and patience. I've looked up a lot of words, but um, my brain sometimes doesn't retain as well as I'd like. Um, so I'm going to do my best. I promise you I've looked up all the words and tried my best, but there will be probably an error too as I read. So just those few disclaimers before I start reading the book, which is called Everything Sad is Untrue by Daniel Neary. This is an, um, there's a couple quotes in introductions before we get started. So here's uh, his message uh, or dedication. When I was a kid in Isfahan, I would tell my mother that someday I would build her a castle at the top of Mount Sofa. I could see it from my window, a castle in the sky. I didn't know that life would make a liar out of me. I'm sorry, mom. I didn't forget. I just never managed it. I wrote you a book instead. I know it isn't even close. And a couple quotes. It seems like only yesterday that I believed that it seemed like only yesterday. It seems like only yesterday that I believed there was nothing under my skin but light. If you cut me, I would shine. Quote from Billy Collins, approximately, on turning 10. Second quote. The people of the world say that Kosru is an idol worshiper. Maybe so, maybe so, but he does not need the world and he does not need the people. Quote from Amir Kosru. Third quote, I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for, that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man, that in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity, of all the blood they've shed, that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that has happened. And that's from the, the Brothers Karamazov. And so the story begins. All Persians are liars, and lying is a sin. That's what the kids in Mrs. Miller's class think, but I'm the only Persian they've ever met, so I didn't know where they got that idea. My mom says it's true, but only because everyone has sinned and needs God to save them. My dad says it isn't. Persians aren't liars. They're poets, which is worse. Poets don't even know when they're lying. They're just trying to remember their dreams. They're trying to remember 6,000 years of history and all the versions of all the stories ever told. 
In one version, maybe I'm not the refugee kid in the back of Mrs. Miller's class. I'm a prince in disguise. If you catch me, I will say what they say in the 1001 Nights. Let me go, and I will tell you a tale passing strange. That's how they all begin. With a promise. If you listen, I'll tell you a story. We can know and be known to each other, and then we're not enemies anymore. I'm not making this up. This is a rule that even geniuses follow. In the 1001 Nights, Scheherazade, the rememberer of all the world's dreams, told stories every night to the king so he would spare her life. But in here, it's just me counting my own memories. And you, reader, whoever you are, you are the king. I'm not sucking up, by the way. The king was evil and made a bloody massacre of a thousand lives before he got to Scheherazade. It's a responsibility to be the king. You've got my whole life in your hands. And I'm just warning you that if I'm going to be honest, I have to begin the story with my Baba Haji, even if the blood might shock you. And don't worry, dear reader and Mrs. Miller, of all the tales of marvel that I could tell you, none surpass in wonder and coolness the one I'm about to tell. Counting the Memories Baba Haji kills the bull. My first memory is blood slopping from the throat of a terrified bull and my grandfather red-handed reaching for my face. I would have been three at this time. Maybe I have memories before that. I don't know. If I did, they'd be flashes of tile patterns or something. I can make it up if you want. But really, it was the blood and the bull braying and the gurgling sound. People ask, really? Really was it blood? They ask because they don't believe me. They don't believe because I'm some poor refugee kid who smells like pickles and garlic and has lice and I'm probably making up stories to feel important. I don't know what the American grown-ups have for memories, but they can't be as beautiful as mine. So they laugh. They don't touch me, but they roll their eyes. Okay, they say. It is, I say. It's one of two memories I have of my Baba Haji. I promise. I haven't been careless with it. My heart clenches it like a fist. Like gripping a ball bearing as hard as you can, the fingers dig deep into the palm and you don't even know if it's still there. The knuckles are white and you're afraid it fell out and you didn't even notice. You're just clenching nothing until your nails cut into your palms and you bleed. The memory is small, barely a few pictures. His face is one still image. It begins in a big gold car. It isn't real gold, just painted the color. It was so big, the seats were two couches on wheels. The car drives on a dirt road through a desert in the middle of Iran, specifically on the road to Ardistan. That doesn't mean anything to you, probably, if you even bother to pronounce it. I could have said on the road to skip this word, you're a dum dum stan, and it'd be the same. It was a desert in a faraway land. You want a map? Here's a map. When I saw the words, people think it, when I say the words, people think it may as well be Mars or Middle Earth. I could say we drove a chariot pulled by camels and they believed me, but it was a Chevrolet and we were normal back then. I wore sneakers with Velcro and had a dad. He had a bushy red mustache and could make weird faces to be funny. He would blow out his cheeks and furrow his eyebrows like a super serious chipmunk. He drove. My mom sat beside him and handed us pieces of pistachio cardamom cake. The road went up and down like an ocean. On either side was sand that could suck down half the car before we could even get out. Some places the sand blew over so you couldn't see any road at all. My dad drove so fast it was like a boat going up a wave and crashing down the other side. My sister and I would shriek as our butts lifted off the seat. My mom would say, Ach, Masood, slow down, you'll kill our children. But this was the road my dad knew by heart because he was born in Artistan and he was going home. He drove hungry for his mom's stew and yogurt. His dad was my Baba Haji. This trip happened every weekend for a while, so this part isn't my first memory. I'm just telling you how it happened every time. The drive would have happened before I saw my Baba Haji slaughter the bull, but I'm not certain. The cake could have been rose and honey. My mom could have said, Ah, Masood, not this again. His mom could have made kebab and yogurt, but those aren't differences that make a difference. The next image is parking outside of the stone walls of my grandfather's courtyard. I see myself because this part is not my own memory. 
It was described to me by my mom. So imagine from up by her head, looking down at me, I'm three years old. I wore corduroys. I carried my stuffed sheep, Mr. Sheep Sheep, in one hand and a stick in the other. I wanted to be a shepherd. My cheeks were chubby and people pinched them constantly, so I scowled a lot. I was the serious chipmunk. Ugh, so cute, the cutest boy you have ever seen, my mom would say. I am now in school in Oklahoma and no one agrees with this. I'm told it would be dusk in the village of Artistan by the time we arrived. The sun shined red behind a dusty mountain. The house was surrounded by a wall 10 feet high. It was 600 years old and made of stone. The garden was inside the wall. It was lined with mosaic tiles. The trees were almond, peach, and fig. At the center was an inlay fountain that cooled you with its whisper. In the corner was the well. But we hadn't seen any of this that first time. I just know it because it's a place in my mind. I could go there now if I wanted. When teachers brought us to the sod house in Oklahoma and told us it was 98 years old, I asked why they'd made a museum out of it. The teacher looked at me like I was simple. Because we preserve and cherish historical things, she said. But no one lives in it? No. So every 98 years, people move out of their houses and turn them into museums? She looked away at this point, probably because her answer would have been, what are you, simple? Okay, class, hold a buddy's hand and keep moving. The first time we went to Artistan, the time I'm telling you about, we got out of the car outside of the walls and heard the sound of men shouting and hooves clonking on the stone. My dad said, stay here, and ran around to the entrance to see if it was one of those demons who hide behind the hedgerows. We didn't stay there, of course. He wasn't the kind of dad you listened to. I remember approaching this gate. Louder and louder, the men shouted, curses, yalla, yalla. I turned the corner. In the courtyard by the well was a bull. Four grown men from the village struggled to hold it down. A giant beast. Its eye was black and bigger than any marble in my collection. In it was a swirl of panic, sweating, shaking, insane with fear. A knife lay on the stone where one of the men had dropped it. The bull saw me. Its eyes looked at me. I remember this because it was the only time I've ever been begged for anything. The bull let out a sound I can only say was like opening your mouth and trying to push all the food out of your stomach. Out of the men slipped off the wet. One of the men slipped off the wet hindquarters and fell. My dad ran over to help. But before he reached them, my grandfather emerged from the house. He wore sandals and his muslin pants were rolled up to his knees. I knew it was my Baba Haji, even though I think this was the first time I had seen him. He stepped off the porch and walked toward the confusion. He shook his head at the mess they had made and sucked his teeth in disgust. In a single motion, he leaned over, picked up the knife, and pushed aside the man grappling with the bull's horns. I heard him say, here, like, here, let me do it. Then with one hand, he grabbed the bull's horn and pulled it sideways. I could no longer see the bull's eye, only its exposed neck. With the other hand, my grandfather stabbed the knife into the bull below its ear, then pulled down and around to the other ear. The whole neck opened. Blood poured onto my grandfather's bare feet. The bull's legs buckled. I heard a gargle. The men stepped back, relieved and embarrassed. It collapsed. My mother must have been the one who screamed. My vision went black. She had covered my eyes. I heard her say, Ah, Masood, as if my father should have known. Underneath her hand was the color red. My next memory is back at the car, outside the walls. Mom was very angry. Dad kind of laughing, because whatever, farm life, you know? He thinks she's overreacting. She won't go back until they clean up the blood. He explains the men were running late. The bull should have been slaughtered hours ago. My grandfather's only grandson, me, had come. What else did she expect? It occurs to me at this point that the feast was for me. The bull must have known I was the right person to beg. I could have saved it. My three-year-old brain doesn't know what that even means. When I tell this whole story, I don't tell anyone about that part. I was just a little kid back then. Still, they'll think I want their pity. In America, they distrust unhappy people. But I don't want pity. I just wonder if they've had this feeling too. The one where you realize it's your fault that something beautiful is dead and you know you weren't worth the trouble. 
When I opened my eyes, my Baba Haji was looking at me. This is the only memory I have of his face. It was craggy, his beard white and red. He had a knit skull cap and a permanent squint from working in the sun. He reached for my cheeks. He smiled at me. His hands were still red with blood. Behind him, the animal was bleeding on the stone. The blood pooled and flowed toward the drain, a red river. Oklahoma also has a red river. It is not red. In some places, it's not even a river. That was my first memory of my grandfather. My second memory is not a true one. It's the kind you invent in your head because you need to. On the phone once with my dad, I was in Oklahoma, he was in Iran, where we, he stayed. He said, your Baba Haji has a picture of you on his mantle. Every day he weeps and kisses it. I imagine him doing this. I don't know what the mantle of his house looks like, so I make one up in my mind out of rough stone. I don't know the picture he had of me, uh, so I make it up. I make up one from Will Rogers Elementary School in Edmond, Oklahoma. He holds the frame in his shaking hand. He cries for me. Ach, my dad tells me Baba Haji only wishes to see me before he dies. I say, okay, it is my job to give this to him. If he dies before he sees me, he will be the bull. It will be my fault. I make up this whole memory of Baba Haji, the vision of him by his mantle so that I can hold it every day. That is all I know about him for sure. I don't want to speak about it anymore. Of my grandmother, Mama Masi, Baba Haji's wife, I have three memories. The first is her feeding me sweet dates dipped in thick yogurt she made. The second is her sitting on a wooden stool weaving a Persian rug in the dark on a giant loom hidden deep in the cellar of their house. The third is her voice on the phone from across the world when I realized I would never see her again. Here in Oklahoma, the kids like to fight me because they know I won't tell anyone. Our bus is 209. The teachers call it the troublesome bus because the kids are so bad. A substitute driver once stopped in the middle of the route, shouted that we were all hooligans and walked out. Everybody sat there. Then everybody screamed and shot even more paper clips at each other. And Brandon Goff pinned me down and shoved spitballs in my ear. Bus 209 is also known as the poor kid bus because it goes to Brentwood Apartments and Forest Oaks, which are the bad neighborhoods with houses that don't have basements for when tornadoes come. We sat there for 30 minutes until the vice principal came and drove us. He gave a speech, but I couldn't hear it because Brandon Goff wouldn't let me take the spitballs out. I should introduce myself. Name, Kosru Nayeri. Age, 12. Hair, I don't know, black. Favorite movie? You know what? I'm not going to introduce myself. You will know me by my voice. In your mind, we're sitting together. You've given me your eyes. I could show you a hill with patches of grass or a peanut butter sandwich. I could help you hear the bells on the neck of a sheep. Ting, ting, ting. In here, you host me. I am your guest, and you probably think of me like you think of yourself. Human. We're so close. You can maybe hear my heart beating, scared. I have one just like yours. I'm scared all of the time. If you say Kosru Nayeri on a class sheet, it wouldn't even look like a name to you, male or female, Elvish or Klingon. You couldn't even say it. It has that k, which is a thrashing sound, like you're trying to hawk up a loogie. It's just spit in your mouth the sound a warthog makes, and the R after the S, that's when you have to roll on your tongue like a cat's purr. But I'm no beast. I'll be a good guest and pay for your hospitality with tales of adventure. You can call me Daniel if you want. The other name? Don't bother with it. Kosru. You wouldn't like it. It was a king's name, actually. Kosru the first was born in Ardistan, my Baba Haji's village, 1500 years ago. He defeated the Romans at Antioch, and when they begged for peace, he gave it to them. The legend goes that one winter he was tired of the cold rain, and so he commanded his artists to create a new season. The Shaw of Shaws wanted spring. And so the great craftsmen of the day made a giant rug 150 feet long, woven with gold and silk and gems. 
The soul was made of gold, the rivers made of crystals, the petals of flowers were rubies, sapphires, and amethyst. The leaves were emeralds, the spring carpet of Kosru defy, defied the weather of the world, it lay at his feet. About a thousand years before Europe discovered toothpaste, Kosru stepped onto a magic carpet that shined brighter than a meadow in May. That's the legend. Kosru, that name ain't for your mouth. But the hero's always less than his legend. Kosru's just a 12-year-old kid with a big butt. You can call him Daniel. When you think about it, the king could stand on the jewel-encrusted carpet, the kaleidoscopic radiance of human greatness, and yet, if he stuck his head out of a window, it'd still be raining. You might be thinking, what kind of 12-year-old talks like that? And I would say, the kind of 12-year-old that speaks three languages. All my life, people have told me I speak weird. In Iran, my Farsi name was, was my Farsi was baby Farsi because I was basically a baby. So I made up my own language. My mom said it was brilliant. So my sister and cousins tried to prove I was faking. They asked me the word for a bunch of things like ladder and chicken, and they wrote them down. Then two days later, they asked me again. And guess what? I said the same words because my new language wasn't some punk baby babble. Also, maybe because it's not that hard to remember 50 words somebody asked you two days ago. The only words I still remember from that language are Finnegansen, beautiful girl, and Finnegans, beautiful boy. That is not one of my many languages anymore. In Italy, I spoke gibberish Italian because we lived in a refugee camp with Roma and Kurds. The people didn't want us there. So if you said, buena sera, they'd say good evening back because they didn't want us to stay. They didn't even want us to learn Italian. In Oklahoma, I spoke like a kid who learned English from a book. When I pronounced the word toilet, toilet, everyone thought I was slow or something. When I used words like parlor instead of living room, they thought I was trying to act superior. It's been three years and my English is A plus now. It's easy to talk like one of them Okies, just gotta loosen your jaw a bit and never let it touch your teeth. Mostly it's slow and comfortable, imagining you own a house and it has a porch and you're sitting on it. Or you can watch the black people on TV and talking like them ain't hard. If you're around them, just nod and go, what up? No question mark. Nobody in America likes grammar Nazis, not even the neo-Nazis who live in Owasso, Oklahoma. Then be cool and don't talk too much and they'll be chill. If it comes up, you can tell them a joke about the weather or yo mama. I wrote a bunch of these down in my notebook when I heard them at recess, so I could always refer back to them if we're about to be friends. One rule in Oklahoma is that if a grony talks to you, speak like an Okie. If a Finnegonzon talks to you, be chill. So I speak well now, and I've memorized tons of words. But if you want the kid version of the story, here goes. Golly gee, hiya, I'm just a dumb kid who likes ice cream. I was born in Iran, happy face, to a family so wealthy that my grandpa's grandpa was a king in the history books. There was a murder and intrigue and Ferris wheels in the desert and a house full of swans, a sapphire blue river and a chest full of gold doubloons. We'll get to that. Then my mom caught, got caught helping the underground church and got a fatwa on her head, which means the government wanted her dead. Oh no, face. We had to sneak out of the country, but my daddy stayed behind. Disappointed face. Maybe not even all that surprised face. We were guests of the Prince of Abu Dhabi for three hours, then homeless. There I cut my head open and they sewed it back together. And then we went to a refugee camp in Italy where I became a great thief until we got asylum in Oklahoma, where we tried to act normal, raised eyebrow face like you don't believe it. I think I skipped the part where my grandmother, mom's mom this time, tried to assassinate her husband, failed, and was exiled instead, and most of the blood, and the secret police, and the torture, sigh face. Listen. The quick version of this story is useless. Let's agree to have a complicated conversation. If you give me your attention, I know it's valuable. I promise I won't waste it with some poor me tale of immigrant woe. I don't want your pity. If we can just rise to the challenge of communication here in the parlor of your mind, 
we can maybe reach across time and space and every ordinary thing to see so deep into the heart of each other that you might agree that I am like you. I am ugly and I speak funny. I am poor. My clothes are used and my food smells bad. I pick my nose. I don't know the jokes and stories you like or the rules to the games. I don't know what anybody wants from me. But, I, but like you, I was made carefully by a God who loved what he saw. Like you, I want a friend. My dad calls me once a month on a Sunday afternoon. Hello? Yeah, hello? Hello, Kosru? Yeah, Baba, it's me. Hello? Yes, what? You son of a dog, why didn't you answer me? I did. Don't speak to your father that way. He speaks in poetry by the great Persian writers, Hafez, Rumi, Ferdowsi. It is two in the morning in Isfahan. I imagine him sitting in the dark house where we all used to live together. The doves in the aviary are asleep. My sister tells me he's probably drunk or on a drug. I think he is in the trance of a thousand-year-old verse. I stand in the kitchen of our house in Edmond, Oklahoma, watching our cocker spaniel sleep in a sunny spot by the back door. In my ear, my Baba's deep voice murmurs the refrains, Unesherana konad ruba masach esdava est esdava est esdava. Do you understand, he says. It's an ancient Farsi that I can only sort of catch. No, I say. You are forgetting already. You're forgetting your own family and your history. These are the poets you should be reading in school. Tell me what it means. It's a clever joke. Your Baba Haji made it from a common phrase. It says, the thing that turns a lion into a little fox is need. Do you understand that? No. Ach, okay, so lions are strong champion creatures, yes? Yes. And a fox is a coward, yes? Really? Yes, in Persian literature, a fox is a coward. In America, it's a tricky animal. Persian literature is 10 times older than America. Okay, okay, fox is a coward, got it. So the riddle asks, what makes the champion a coward? Need? Yes, the weakness of needing something. Now the lion must beg for it. He is no king if he needs anything. Okay, how is that a joke? Because your Baba Haji changed the word need to marriage. Now it says, what turns a great lion into a needy fox? Marriage. I pause. Because etiage rhymes with evzadage. So the change is clever. Okay. If ever there was a cleverness in the joke, it has been wrung out like a dish towel. It was a lion, says my father. He wants me to understand so badly. He wants me to know the Persian poets like I know American rappers. I feel desperate to give him the connection, but can't. I was a lion, he says, and I was married. And now I sit by the phone and beg to speak to my children. Do you see? His voice crumbles. I imagine the telephone wire going from my hand into our wall, into the ground, under our yard, up the telephone pole, across the flat prairie to the Gulf of Mexico, under the water, under the Atlantic, past Gibraltar, across the Mediterranean, under Turkey, into Iran, over the Zagros Mountains to Isfahan, to our street, to our house, to my Baba's chair, to his ear, where he sits crying. I listen to him weep into the phone. When he's finished, he says, are you doing well in school? Straight A's. Good, good. You're my champion of champions. Thank you, I say. Okay, be good. Okay. Send pictures. Okay. And we say goodbye. They say my father's family got their land from the king of India in gratitude for saving his daughter's life. This was generations upon generations ago, before Oklahoma was even a state. No one ever told me exactly when. There was never enough time for details. There were no lazy Sunday afternoons sitting beside the fountain in the courtyard with aunts or uncles or no moment to ask, was this ancestor around when they had horse-drawn carriages? Or was he around when the phoenix flew its fiery wings over hillside villages? Did he know the prophet Daniel when he came to Persia? Or did he know the doctor Ibn Sina 1,200 years later? This greatest of grandfathers, was he from the age of myth? the age of heroes, or the age of history. Dastan, Persia, Iran, 
The boundaries of these three countries are nothing but 10 feet of fog. In Daslan land, the mythical age, my great, 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 great grandfather was a doctor. Nobody in Mrs. Miller's class had trouble believing this because doctors aren't all that special anyway. It wasn't like I said he was a beast master. Anyway, he was a doctor, not a rich guy with a stethoscope. Don't imagine that. More like a young man who spent all his time in the library of the university or the private archives of the local magistrate. He spent his money on herbs and plant roots and oils to make things like ointments for burns and cuts. And he spent the rest of his money on paper and ink so he could take notes on what worked and what didn't. He was poor, they said, but generous. He lived in an ancient city. How ancient, Jared S. said when I told this part to him. It's just a city, I said. Like from Aladdin? Yeah, like that. In myths, they don't spend time describing things like cities. The herbs aren't fenugreek, wormwood, or yarrow. They're just herbs. He's not a specific man with shoulders built strong on his father's plow. He's just a guy who left home and became a student. A myth is only an explanation, not an exploration. This one explains how my father's family became kings. But if this was a story in the heroic age, they would give my great-grandfather a name, Jamshid, and a personality, ever-laughing Jamshid, with a limp in the foot his father crushed with a plow. Jamshid, who took even a broken finch as his most honored patient. He lived in Isfahan, the city of covered bridges, the city that smelled Jeff Jasmine. The young doctor was soon famous for his willingness to help the poor and the untouchables. He even sat with those who weren't sick, only sad brokenhearted, or lost. They would sit in his small garden under an apricot tree. He would give them tea and sesame cookies, and he would listen. Doctor, I am going to die. Come now, sir, don't say such things. It is true. I'm half dead already, three quarters almost. What can I do then? Hemlock. I can't. It must be hemlock. Hemlock is poisonous. Then belladonna, also poisonous. I know, doctor, I know. This is about that lovely Miriam, isn't it? Ugh, doctor, send me how to a world without her. I am the unhappiest of men. She refused your offer of marriage. Yes, well, no, I don't know. So you might also be the happiest of men. I don't know. Sir, please let go of my hand. If you don't know, don't you think we could wait a little and find out? But you see, this is my problem. This is my problem. Waiting? No. If she says yes, Miriam who loves me and I who love Miriam, we will be richer in joy than the great Erxus. It sounds nice. Except her brothers have sworn to poison me. I will die. She will be widowed and left to those villains. I see. And if she says no in order to prevent all this, that one is obvious, doctor. I see. So, the hemlock, if you please, doctor, a large gunny sack of it. Right away. No one will blame you. I'll tell everyone I got it from a dervish. You're too kind. But first, have you heard of Mithridate's antidote? Could I offer you the story? Doctor, I don't want to be rude. You're pressed for time. I understand. It will be short. I don't want to go to the, I don't go to the baker for soap, and I don't go to the storyteller for cures but you've come to a doctor for a killing drink. Of course, a builder can make and unmake a house. Both are his job. The price of my poison is to hear my story. Ah, very well, doctor. Only because you have been kind to my mother. Once upon a time. Don't get greedy, doctor. A quick anecdote, if you please. The father of the great king Mithridates was assassinated at a banquet. He'd been poisoned, you see as I would be if I married my love. Yes, now you see the connection. And so Mithridates went into hiding. He wandered the forest and vowed to become stronger than his enemies. Every day he drank a sublethal do dose of poison until his body became accustomed to it. And so when he returned to his kingdom, he imprisoned his mother and brothers, who he suspected had killed his father, and he threw a banquet. They put arsenic in his meat, and stared aghast to watch him eat. 
They poured strychnine in his cup and shook to see him drink it, but Mithridates was immune to such a death. He smiled and drank, then he offered each of them a sip from his own goblet. They were his friends, after all. They couldn't refuse. If they did, he would know that they knew that he was poisoned. And so each drank and each died, and the poets say, I tell the tale that I heard told, Mithridates, he died old. So, so, so you think I should ambush her brothers with such a ploy? No, I think whatever grievance you have with your future brothers, you should offer forgiveness and ask them for theirs. This is not what the story said, doctor. Sure it is. It said Mithridates foiled the plans of his killers. It said his friends hated him. It said he killed his mother and brothers. Yeah, but he died old. Kill everyone at a party, and you are the life of the party, but that doesn't make you good company. I think your story needs work, doctor. You're probably right. To explain that Mithridates was happy with this decision, and perhaps add the idea that he did not become strong by drinking poison daily, he only became full of poison himself. That's good. His poisoned heart beat poisoned blood. I will work on it. No, no, I think you should stick to physician's work. Very well, then. I'll ask Miriam's brothers to sit with me. That sounds like a good plan. One of them suffers in his back when he sleeps. I will give you an ointment. He'll sleep like a mountain bear. Thank you, doctor. The thing is that I don't have money. It's my wedding gift, then. I must tell Miriam. Go. She'll make you her honey cake. I would be honored. Best in Isfahan. Her hand sweetens the honey itself. I'm in your debt. When I tell this story to Mrs. Miller's class, I don't do the talking parts. There's just too much to explain. I only say Jamshid was famous for taking his payment in whatever patients could offer. Honey cake, a chicken that laid hard boiled eggs, three bottles of jam made from his garden's apricots. That's super weird, says Jennifer S. Jennifer S. thinks everything that isn't in a mall is weird. And so the legend goes that he was a good man, peculiar, and not very good at explaining stories clearly. But see, this is the thing with legends. They are more detailed than myths, but not always more accurate. So the telling goes, the young doctor of Isfahan was summoned to the palace of a great pasha. No one knows the details, so let's imagine them. Miriam's cousin, a merchant of rare furs, knocks on the doctor's back gate. He has returned from the court of a Parsi king who worshipped the Hindu gods. In the bazaar, as he haggled, he saw a magistrate climb onto a mountain of rings, despite the rug merchant's protests, and shout over the crowd, the Pasha, generous and merciful. At this point, Jared S. interrupts. Wait, who's the cousin? I'm confused, says Jennifer L. Can you make him do his reports on horses or normal stuff, says Doug P.? No, Mrs. Miller says, I would hope that everyone does the research assignment and writes a report on their actual family, Douglas. Doug P. made up a bunch of stuff about horses in case you didn't figure it out. Anyway, Jared says, is the cousin the same guy as before who wanted the poison? No, that's Miriam's husband, says Jessica, who is the best listener. It doesn't matter, I say. None of these people are important. The only person to remember is Jamshid. The rest are just people for the story. The only part I know for sure is Jamshid. Then get to the point, says Jared. The point was that the Pasha's daughter suffered a supernatural illness. Magistrates, like the pompous ones in the bazaar who did not purchase a rug after all that, were sent to every city to find doctors to help her. And the cousin doesn't matter whose cousin, had the letter of invitation for the doctor of Isfahan, which he had promised to deliver in exchange for a meager fee. When my father tells it, he skips all of this guessing because he's the greatest storyteller of the family and he has a nose for when the strange turns of history begin to sound too much like myths. He only speaks what we know for certain. He says, your great, great, great grandfather earned all this land he was a doctor, the best in Isfahan. At that time, a pasha in India had a daughter who was sick, probably with a mild schizophreniform disorder. But back then, they had no diagnosis for these things. So 
he prescribed a sedative. She calmed down and eventually grew out of it. That's it. To me, this was tight-fisted. What about the court of the Pasha? Was the daughter beautiful? I will tell you, reader, that I imagine her like Kelly, Jay, who looks nothing like a Pasha's daughter, but very much like a Disney princess. How long would it take the doctor to caravan to India? And what did he do in the heat of the day as the camels lay on the ground resting? I would imagine he walked into the palace and looked up to see the daughter watching from a terrace above him in the grand hall. At that exact moment, he fell forever in love with her. But she was racked with convulsions and delusions and horrific visions. In her bedroom, he would submit the full weight of his knowledge to healing her condition, knowing all the while that his success would only separate them forever. And she too might have loved the Persian doctor, cursed though she was with the illness. She might have come to prefer it for his company. The tragedy of love would unfold as the doctor could never sit by and watch the princess in such pain. He would heal her and together they would suffer the duller ache of longing. I would imagine him trudging behind a long caravan back to Isfahan broken. But my father would make uh, no concessions to myth-making when the truth was available. The Pasha gave him his weight in gold, my father would say, and once again in jewels. And your great-great-great-grandfather returned home. He bought all the land around Ardistan. That was all we knew. He returned with enough treasure to buy thousands of acres. Enfolded in them were mountains and a river and enough villages to make him a local government unto himself. If only he had been fat, joked my father, we'd be twice rich. But your father's fathers were all cursed with heroic fitness. Sure, Dad. It's true, he says. You don't think it's true? When we have this conversation, I'm in the kitchen in Oklahoma, where they make fun of kids with hairy arms and bubble butts. I imagine my father, a portly bear who I've come, I've never seen move faster than a brisk walk. Well, it's true. You descend from kings, good-looking ones. Suddenly, I realize he's saying that because my mom told him about school, about Brandon Goff pointing at how my shirt doesn't go straight down my back and shouting to everyone that I have a bubble butt. This happened in the halls, and Kelly J. wasn't around, but still. I didn't say anything to my dad because I'm not even sure how he knew I guess my sister saw me stretching out my shirts on the back of a chair and told my mom, and they figured it out. I didn't say anything to my dad. It's not like he could do anything but talk on the phone anyway. We don't live in the heroic age. Our separation isn't any great poetic struggle. It's just pain. It's just ripping bodies apart. Anyway, that's how we had all that land. In Oklahoma, we are the opposite of kings. Everything we own is inside a hard gray suitcase. It's mostly coats and papers. There's one squished shoebox full of photos that my mom guards and cries over when she thinks we're asleep. We left all the toys and the books and my candy bars. It has been years since we've left Iran, but I wonder about the candy bars. One of my last memories of Iran is my dad coming home with a case of Auric candy bars a few weeks before we had to escape. When people here ask me what kind of candy I like, I say Auric, and we go through the exact same script every time. They frown. So I explain, they're chocolate-covered coconut. Oh, like Mounds Bars, we have those here. Everyone is always insisting they have things here, but they do not have Auric or my father. That is two things. They have everything else here. The grocery stores scared us at first. They have chips, that are all the same shape and stack on top of each other in a tube, but they don't have auric bars. I say, like a mounds bar, but they taste different. Oh, say the gronies as if they don't believe me. How? I don't know how to explain. I barely remember the taste of auric. I only know I ate a mounds bar and it wasn't my favorite, most amazing thing in my mouth. So it must be different. I usually say, I also like Kit Kat. They smile because I finally answered something normal. I don't say that in Iran, Kit Kats aren't broken into bars. They're just one flat square. Whenever my dad brought home a candy, a case of candy bars, we ran to the door. I was just a five-year-old kid. My sister was eight. Our dad had such a habit of bringing home cases of chocolate that my mom had made me a place to store them. 
She took a clown doll and sewed giant baggy pants around that ruffled out with around it that ruffled out with dozens of little pockets. Back then, she sewed us all kinds of toys. She even made a step stool, the shape of a big red bus, stuffed with cushions so I could reach my bed. Anyway, we'd run up to my dad. Baba! He was a dentist who worked above a candy shop. They used to joke that it was the perfect arrangement. We opened our mouths so that Baba could look. I remember the taste of his thumb better than Oric. He would look in my mouth, push on my molars to make them perfectly straight. I used to think my Baba could change the shape of teeth as easily as the great hero Rostam could move mountains. After he checked our teeth, I would hug his right side because he kept cigarettes in his left breast pocket. This is a memory that has no sound, but probably it should have my Baba's laugh, which was a such a rich and resonant chortle that it fills rooms of my memory that he was not even in. He was still thin at that time with a bushy red mustache. I only remember him eating kebab and ice cream. He presented the last case of Oric, probably 30 or 40 bars. From here, the memory splits into three dessert-oriented stories. The first is the myth of the baker and Tamar. The second is the legend of my sister's cleverness. And the third is the history of a clown's underpants. You should know something. In school, they have dances that other kids go to. There are about six reasons I don't go. One, they're at night and you need a ride. Two, I don't know what they are like. Three, I don't dance. Four, Brandon Goff goes. Five, his friends still call me bubble butt and it's become a thing. Six, no one ever asked me. But last week I was standing in the courtyard after lunch and Jennifer S. walked up to me. She had to walk all the way over from where people are, so it took forever. She was trying not to laugh. I checked my armpits for sweat and stuff like that. I tried to straighten my hair down. I dropped the acorns I was holding, because it's weird to count acorns. When she arrived, she said, hey, are you going to the dance? I said, hi, Jennifer. She said, are you going to the dance? I said, no. She turned around and walked back. You should know, reader, that Jennifer S. is a finagonzom, for sure. But I have a crushed heart for someone else. I won't tell you about her yet, because sometimes love has to be kept secret. If other people find out, they attack it. I thought maybe Jennifer S. was asking me to the dance, but then I saw her walk back to her group, and they all laughed, and her friend gave her back her purse, so maybe it was a deer. I don't know. The myth of the baker and Tamar and its relations to my dad and candy bars and the love of his life. In my hometown of Isfahan, there is another town, a hidden town completely surrounded but separate called Nujolfa. In 1606, the Shah Abbas created the city of Jolfa and gave it to the Armenians who were running from the Ottoman emperor because they were Christians. In Holfa, they were allowed to be Christian and to build churches. But if they ever spoke to the people of Isfahan about their faith, the Shah would cut off their heads. And so you can imagine, Holfa kept to itself. As the centuries passed, the little city prospered. By the time I was born in 1982, they were kings of pastry and the undisputed king of kings the Shah in Shah of these bakeries was Akhtamar. The people of Isfahan ventured to the center of the strange neighborhood to stand in line before the famed bakery of Akhtamar just for six of his cream puffs. They said he was the Padash Padashah of Padasho, the ruler supreme of rosewater and cream. He was an old man. By the time I ate one of his pastries, I was just a little kid. He might have been dead like McDonald's, I don't know. I remember eating a cream puff in our kitchen in Isfahan and counting the guests to see if I could have another. A man, I don't remember if it was my uncle, I don't even remember his face, said, that Abbas is king. I think the baker's name was also Abbas. The man started to tell the story that Baker Abbas was once a poor son of Nuholfa with a heart overfilled with happiness. Very handsome, very handsome, agreed the woman listening. The man in my memory goes on. And though the Armenians had no king at this time, they had Tamar, who was so beautiful she shined. 
as she walked through the bazaar. There is no notion as important as love. Abbas saw Tamar one day and fell into an ocean of it. And she, when she saw him, a delivery boy for a green grocer at the time, she fell into a kind of heart sickness that can only be described as an equal mixture of love and grief. She was a governor's daughter, of course, and the rich never forget the social order. Tamar, at this moment, knew she was hopelessly in love with Abbas and also that her love was hopeless. It is no magic to guess what happens next. They meet and speak electric words to each other. Hi. Hello. They flit around each other when she orders from the greengrocer daily. They steal kisses in the shadows of her father's vaulted staircase. She weeps in his arms and tells him they can never marry. Her father, her mother, sees them from her window. She promises her daughter to some fancy boy who once visited Paris. Abbas pours himself into his pastry craft. He races time. He races the courtship of Tamar to what's his name? He sculpts chickpea cookies with a steady hand. They are each individually perfect. None crumble. He takes a stall in the rear alcove of the bazaar and sells them. He makes saffron rice pudding, stirring patiently, pulling the pot from the fire with a troubadour's timing. It is a perfect sunrise yellow. He layers his baklava generously with walnuts and cardamom. His almond cakes are subtle and the cherry puree on top is joyous, bold, even a little wanton. Soon no one remembers Abbas, the greengrocer's errand boy, only Abbas, the master baker of all of Isfahan. His first large order is from a governor who wants a thousand cream puffs for the wedding of his daughter, Tamar. Abbas dies here. His heart crumbles into chickpea flour. Late in the evening, the merchants of the bazaar hear him weeping in the rear alcove as they shudder their stalls. Here is something I would like to tell you. Stories get better as they get more true. The sad truth of this story is that Abbas was truly and completely ruined. His tears, they said, were the warm water baths that steamed up his oven. His trembling hands whipped pastry cream as light as a shroud. When the guests at Tamar's wedding ate the cream puffs, they could taste the truest thing in all the world at that moment, the baker's pain. They didn't understand this, of course. To them, they were simply the most delicious pastries they'd ever eaten. They toasted the merry couple. When Tamar tasted one, it was a love letter. She ran to her room and sobbed into a pillow. This is how the greatest bakery in Newhofa came to be called Ak Tamar. The sound of a punch to the rib. Ak! Oh! Oh, Tamar! the sound of the old master baker weeping in the back kitchen. In my memory of this story's telling, in our kitchen in Isfahan, the man finished his tail and popped another cream puff into his mouth. I can almost squint and see him. Yes, I think he's my uncle Ahmad who fancied himself a storyteller. Memories are always partly untrue. It could have been his brother, Reza. A patchwork story is the shame of a refugee. In Oklahoma, I go to the library sometimes. My mom drops me off on Saturday mornings before she goes to work. It is a small one-story building with gray carpets. It does not have a Persian section. The, thing, the first thing I read are comics about Calvin and Hobbes. He is a boy who seems to hate the world as it is and love the world that ought to be. The tiger is his sane mind, which goes to sleep too much so that he never knows what to believe and never knows which world he is in. I like him because he speaks better than a kid. When you're sending the whole, spending the whole day at the library, it's important to do stuff in chunks. First, read all the new comics. Then look at the new magazines with sports on them and write down the phrases that are cool, like the whole kit and caboodle, which means everything, and put on a clinic, which means taught. When the Chicago Bulls put on a clinic and took home the whole kit and caboodle, it means they won. In the bathroom, the old people are gone, so the next thing to do is find the section that has poems that tell stories. It's easy to learn languages when the sounds rhyme. There's one poem about a kid named Roland who's walking from one country to another and he's scared. When he looks down at the wet field, he thinks the grass looks like ugly hair sticking up from his bloody head. He says, 
Thin, dry blades pricked the mud, which underneath looked kneaded up with blood. And then he sees a stiff, blind horse and thinks it's the saddest thing he's ever seen, but he doesn't know what to do to help him. He can't just leave it there in the bloody field, but he doesn't have a way to help either, and he wants to keep going. Suddenly, he starts to talk himself into caring less about it. Little by little, to make sure his heart doesn't break, he makes himself immune to the pain of the horse with its shut eyes underneath the rusty mane. Then he says, he must be wicked to deserve such pain. Just like that, it's the horse's fault. I don't believe that, reader. I think Roland is a dumb kid who just wants to forget he ever saw the horse. My mom usually gives me an egg sandwich to eat, but people hate the smell of egg sandwiches, so I eat it in the bathroom. The librarian at the Edmund, Edmund Library is a woman named Helen Brown, and she's the kindest person I've ever met and would never leave a horse in a field or blame it for anything. Mrs. Brown gave me a library card. I'm allowed to check out 35 books and can visit the library every two weeks. That is 70 books a month. In one year, I will read 100 or I will read 840 books. I don't care what they're about, only that they contain English. Mrs. Miller says this is the only way to learn. One time I found a book on Persians in the myth section. It said, Akhtamar, the largest of four islands in the Lake Van, Turkey. According to folk legend, an Armenian princess lived on the island. Every night she held a lamp so that the boy she loved could swim from the mainland to meet her. One night her father caught her and smashed the lamp. The boy was lost in the lake and drowned. Locals claim to hear his dying words, Ak Tamar, to this day. The legend of my sister's cleverness is a family story that people mention anytime they want to call me Maslum. Maslum is a word I can never tell you what it is in English. It is someone who is cute and pitiful. Maslum is a puppy, but not a happy puppy, a kicked puppy. Maslum is something you just want to hold and say sorry to, a victim. When I was four and wanted to cry, I knew they would laugh at me. What grief could a chubby toddler feel? And I knew I could not run, so I would clench my fists and roll my eyes up to look at the ceiling as if maybe the tears would go back down into my eyes. I would stand in one place and tremble and wish the welling tears would just dry up, but tears are like genies. They will never go back into the bottle. My sister would say, ah, he's so maslum, his cheeks and those little fists. In the story, they would say, Kosru was always so maslum that he had no idea when his sister would trick him. When Masud would bring home a box of Oric candy bars, he would run and put his portion into the pockets of his clown. She would say, Kosru, let's have a race to see who can eat their candy bar first. At this time, Kosru loved his sister and would agree to anything she proposed. He would shove the entire candy bar into his mouth. She would say, you're so fast, I can't keep up. As soon as he had swallowed the auric bar, she would reveal hers and nibble it slowly while his mouth watered. Mmm, this is so good. I'm just going to enjoy it forever. Kosru's fists would clench and his eyes would roll up to the ceiling. That's it. She was very clever. Here in Oklahoma, we don't talk very much. She hates Ray and wants our dad back. I don't know. We just don't talk. What else is there to say? She's the best student the teachers have ever seen. They can see it in her eyes. They are not begging eyes. They are watchful and hungry. They want something that, for now, school can give. If she gets A plus in everything and starts a club and builds an after school program and scores perfect on all the state tests, they will have to love her. But she doesn't understand that people are immune to the happiness of her others too, and not just their pain. They're numb to everything. They don't even see her. I think she thinks I forget our dad and accepted Ray or something. The history of the clown's underpants is a secret history and I will never tell it. But if you think people are stupid and Maslum and all you ever do is take from them, then they eventually learn how to survive you. They learn to hide away everything they love where you can't touch it. And they won't just hide it someplace easy to find like a clown's pockets or any place in this world. They'll create a new world with its own language and they'll hide everything there. 
all the favorite jokes they won't say around you, all the best books, the spot on the wall that looks like a keyhole, being safe and free and comfortable, all those things, and you won't even know they exist. And when you've gotten your hand on the one auric and you've laughed at the badly hidden tears, you won't even know there was a secret zipper in a yellow, in a bus pillow where the rest of the bars were really hidden. Not some obvious clown. You won't know because you believed the weak can't do anything, but hiding is something to do while you wait to get stronger. Deep hiding. Hiding so sneaky that it's hidden below tears that you think are trying to hide themselves, but they're actually decoy tears, not real ones. Why did he even start talking about desserts? I don't remember. I guess the point of all this is to say, I don't like the cream puffs here in Oklahoma, which they call Twinkies. Here is a list of foods we discovered in America. Peanut butter, marshmallows, barbecue sauce. You can say, can I have barbecue to a kid's mom at potlucks? And they'll know what you mean. Puppy chow, Chex cereal covered in melted chocolate and peanut butter and tossed in powdered sugar. They only give it to you if you win a Valentine friend. Corn chip pie, not a pie. Chili on top of corn chips with sour cream and cheese. S'mores. They say it super fast like s'mores. Banana pudding. They don't say the G. Sometimes they don't even say the B. Here's a list of foods from Iran that they have never heard of. All of it. All the food. Jared Rhodes didn't even know what a date was. I have a new father here in America. Did I mention this already? It's called a stepdad. His name is Rahim, but he tells Americans to call him Ray. My sister says the only reason mom married him was to give me a male role model so I'd know how to grow up into a man and so we wouldn't be on welfare. Ray is thin and doesn't have a beard, the opposite of my dad. My dad drinks alcohol, but Ray quit when he quit smoking. My dad is a chimney. My dad quotes the great per Persian poets, Rumi, Hafaz, Ferdowsi. Ray only reads the Bible. Ray cuts his hair kind of like Bruce Lee because he says Lee is the only martial artist who deserves to be feared. Ray is a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. I would rather face a villain with a gun than a man with Ray's 360 back kick. There is no one in Oklahoma as good at fighting as Ray. We don't talk much after what happened the first Christmas we spent in apartment 404, except for nights when he comes home with an action movie. He wakes me up and we watch all the greats, Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, Bolo Young, Philip Ray, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Ray covers my eyes when there are naked women. He pauses the fight scenes and quizzes me on the best techniques. There, did you see that? He kicked the guy into the ears. Before that, it was a sidekick. Look at him, chamber his knee. He'll fiddle with the VCR till it pauses on the exact moment of Van Damme holding his knee up to his chest before exploding it out sideways into a guy's stomach. The power is here. Ray stands up, moves the table so he can show me properly. He'll stand in front of the TV on one foot with his knee chambered, just like Van Damme. He's the Persian version of the muscles from Brussels. From here, he'll say, you punch out into a sidekick, or you can rotate your hips and swing around into a lead leg roundhouse. He extends his leg into a perfect sidekick, then brings it back and does the roundhouse. He's standing on one leg the whole time, one fist at his chin, the other by his ear, the whole time. Or if he comes in, you chamber, he flinches, you put down the knee, switch feet into a swing kick. He does the maneuver and swings his back foot right up to my temple. He stops a hair away. I don't flinch. It would ruin the movie if I flinch. I know all the best kicks from 37 rated R movies. The axe kick in Best of the Best, the side kick in Enter the Dragon, the 360 back kick in Best of the Best 2, the roundhouse in King of the Kickboxers. I've done each of them a hundred times. Actually, I've done the other guy. The one who telegraphs his punch and misses with his other arm down and leaves himself wide open. 
Ray whizzes the famous kicks right past my nose, so close it tickles. By the time the movie's over, I have to go back to bed because I have school in the morning. I have no idea where Ray goes. He's usually not there in the morning. Someday, I will be strong enough to break his jaw. I don't hate him, but it will be my job to fight him. I will not miss. The myth about Ray, the one I heard in a whispered voice from my mom, is that he was one of 16 kids in a part of Iran so far north that it bordered the Soviet Union. His mom died when he was five, and his father remarried a woman who had more kids. The dad was a giant brown bear, they said. In the mornings, he would scrabble out into the woods and return. In the evening, no one questioned him. One day, when Rahim was 10, he dropped something, a bowl or a cup, doesn't matter, and broke it. They say his dad stood up, grabbed Rahim by the hair, and dragged him across a lawn to the first tree on the forest's edge. He took off his belt. He pushed Rahim up against the tree. He wrapped the belt around the trunk and Rahim and tightened it. He tore a long green branch from the bough of the tree and whipped Rahim until he bled from his neck and arms and cheeks and ears. Then he left. Rahim was tied to the tree for two days. He stood there, unable to sleep or sit down. He cried out for a while, but was afraid only the bear would answer. Only his new mother dared to help him. At night, she snuck out of the house with rags to wash his cuts and gave him food and water. That was how he knew she had accepted him, even though she wasn't his mother. And that was how he knew his siblings weren't ever going to help him. After the two days, Ray knew he was alone. When he turned 17, his dad sent him to America to earn money. When he arrived, he had no English, no place to stay, and less than 20 bucks. But more than language and more than money and more than a house, he knew he needed an axe kick strong enough to cut down a bear. He walked into a dojo in Oklahoma City run by an old Korean man named Master Moon. Years later, when I signed up at a school, Ray called it a toy gym because it was run by a guy named Carrie, and it was full of rich kids with brand new head protectors on sale in the back. Moon's gym was just a room off the highway with exposed cement beams and heavy bags held together with duct tape. Ray said they could would do so many roundhouse drills that all the skin on the balls of his pivot foot would rip off and the blood would start pooling on the carpet, at first the size of a quarter, then a plate. They would stand in line, holding one knee up, and Master Moon would attack their shins with bamboo rods until they passed out. Everybody in Moon's gym was a super stud. They weren't afraid of anyone. Master Moon was a sixth degree black belt. I know now that this part isn't true, but I used to think Master Moon had the death touch where he'd hit your chest with an open palm and the impact would burst your heart like a gusher. He was a knotted up old Korean guy and since Ray couldn't pay any money, he made Ray a deal. Ray went to live at, a mas at Master Moon's house. In exchange for a room and Taekwondo training, Ray would clean the Moon family house and make their meals. Mrs. Moon had a condition where she couldn't work anymore, but she would rather die than eat some Iranian kids' teenage cooking. So she would sit in the corner of their tiny kitchen and yell at him in Korean. Neither spoke English, so she'd say, cut the radishes in Korean, and he'd say, pick up the knife in Farsi. Now cut the radishes in Korean. What should I do with the knife in Farsi? The radishes, radishes. Cut these? No, long ways. Like this? No. Then she'd scream. And screaming is the same in Korean, Farsi, and English. Until years passed and Ray finally knew how to make bulgogi, kimchi, bibibap, mumalangi, and all super serious Korean foods. That's how Ray became a third-degree black belt and how he got that bear slang uppercut that he only ever used on single moms. If you really want to know the truth, it's the forgetting that hurts most. Not the secret police trying to murder us. Not Brandon Goff shooting paper clips at my neck. Not Ray. Not everyone thinking I'm gross. Those pains are pains that make me strong. I imagine the more they bleed me, the more I become like jerked meat, a dried bull, a hard leather. But no matter how hard I clench my fist, the memories pour out of it and disappear. 
When you kill a monster in Final Fantasy, it makes a sound like a groan and disintegrates into sand. None of them are strong enough to keep two grains together once they die. You could imagine the elemental fiends clenching their toothy jaws, but even they just crumble. That's what forgetting your grandpa's face feels like. There's no good in it, nothing to gain but nothing. A piece of your heart makes a sound like a groan and disappears. Then you poke at it sometimes, trying to remember what was there by the shape of the hole. That's it. You are less. The truth is, that's why I'm writing all this. Behind me is the elemental fiend of my memories crumbling into powder. I watch an arm disintegrate and instantly forget what was there. Did I ever hug Baba Haji? What was that like? Did he smell like a farmer or a shepherd? He was both. Did his arms feel strong? You don't get to choose what you remember. A patchwork memory is the shame of a refugee. Did I tell you that already? I could still tell you how I left the toys in my room, how many auric bars I left in that bus cushion, but I couldn't tell you what it feels like to have a grandpa. I also forgot Italian when I learned English. I also forgot all the bad things about my dad when I met Ray. I also forgot my granddad on my mom's side, but he's less important because I think he's a killer who married a child bride. The farthest back I can remember on my mother's side is a meadow outside the house of my great-grandmother, who we called Aziz. Cutting straight across the meadow was a secret tiny river, no wider than the length of my arm. I could hop back and forth or straddle it like a giant. The green grass on either side was tall enough to flop over the banks and hide the river. That's why it was a secret. If you looked from the house window and you'd see a crazy kid jumping ziggy-zaggy across the field, but the almost underground river wasn't a brook or a creek. The water flowed through it at river speed. If you slipped when you did a straddle jump and a foot went into the water, it would grab your ankle and yank. I remember squatting by it and staring at the clear water rushing over the stones. My little hand wasn't enough to block it. A few yards up the river, my sister put her hand in the river, but her hands were bigger. So every once in a while, the water would stop and the stones would glimmer and tiny fish would flop between them. I would shout and she would lift her hand and the water would come rushing back. I believed, as deeply as you can believe anything, that one of those fish would pop its head above the water and speak to me like in the 1001 Nights stories because I was the one who told my sister to make the river flow again. It would say, oh, happy boy, may the wise and eternal God bless you for saving me. I would reply, he is wise indeed, showing I'm a good guy in the story who believes in God and not one of those Dijons who speaks against him. Then the fish would go on, but still I am drowning in sorrow, if not in air. I was once the prince of a great green city on the banks of a river 1,000 times bigger than this, with skiffs and felucas and galleons sailing on it to bring my people silk, spices, and animals, as you have never seen from the corners of the world. What happened, honorable prince, I would ask? What brought you low? The fish would say, I will tell you a tale passing strange and wondrous as a warning so what that what happened to the ox and the baker in my great green city might not happen to you. Tell me, I would say, tell me, please, Mr. Fish, tell me the warning. Even though I would ask three times, the prince fish would dart suddenly back into the water and would swim, swim downstream. To lose something you never had can be just as painful because it is the hope of having it that you lose the hope that in this world there are magical fish who will give you advice and warning when really the future is unknowable and infinitely dangerous. The story of the magical fish is just a nice thing I imagined. I never had anything like it. I remember hearing my sister walk across the meadow from upstream. Hey, Kosru, she said, what are you doing? I shrugged. The magic fish was long gone. Let's play a game, she said. We played a game where she would stand upstream and drop a combination of wildflowers into the river. I would wait downstream and shout what I saw. Yellow, red, blue. No, it was red, yellow, red, blue. That was it. Not really a game. 
I would scoop the flowers out of the water and arrange them into piles. I would give them to Aziz, I thought. She would forgive that we had emptied her meadow. The last set of colors was yellow, blue, brown. When I scooped it out, I screamed because it was a wet, mushy poop. I threw it down. I smelled my hand. There was some left. I shook my hand and wiped it on the grass. I stuck it in the river, but sister said, there's more in there. A new bulb of sewage flowed past. I pulled my hand out and shuddered. There's a woman up there washing diapers, she said, nodding upstream. My pile of flowers was ruined. My magic river was just drainage gully. The game all along was to get my hand in a sewer. Thanks for listening. See you next time.